I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. You are listening to Moderate Rebels. This is part two in our episode on Vice. In part one, we discussed the origins of Vice as a nihilistic hipster magazine, and we talked about how it's transformed into a global corporate media empire with billions of dollars of investment from some of the biggest media companies in the world, including Rupert Murdoch's 21st Century Fox, HBO, A&E Networks, Disney, and even private equity firms and venture capital firms. And we talked about how, of course, simultaneously with the influx of this massive capital investment, we also saw a concerted attempt by the Obama administration to take Vice under its wing. We saw a senior Obama administration official, Alyssa Mastromonaco, became chief operating officer of Vice Media. And we saw how its editorial policy really just dovetailed very neatly with U.S. imperialism and how this corporate media empire advocates for the maintenance and expansion of the American political, military, and economic empire. In this episode, we are again joined by the filmmaker and journalist Robbie Martin. He is also co-host of Media Roots Radio with Abby Martin, his sister, another great journalist and friend of the show. You can find part one of our episode on Vice and our discussion with Robbie at several different places at Patreon. Our Patreon page is patreon.com slash moderate rebels. You can also find it on iTunes and uh, SoundCloud. And then, of course, we also have our own website. That is moderaterebelsradio.com. As for this episode, in part two of our investigation into Vice, we are going to put a microscope to a world in disarray. This is a new documentary that was produced by Vice Media in collaboration with the Council on Foreign Relations. And this is really the kind of imperialist coming out moment or neoconservative coming out moment for Vice. The moment at which it just makes it absolutely crystal clear that not only is it advocating on behalf of U.S. imperialism and it's basically towing the U.S. government line on foreign policy and its reporting, but more than just that, it is actually effectively merged with the foreign policy establishment in Washington, D.C. So here's Max. We'll continue our discussion with Robbie Martin. We talk constantly in this country about the propaganda, first of all, that we're supposedly subjected to by uh, foreign powers, particularly Russia. You know, on this show, we look at that as kind of a joke, mainly because uh, we've never met anyone whose vote in the 2016 election or on any matter was swayed by an RT show. Um, we can kind of put that to bed. It's like playing Where's Waldo? Like, where's the guy who watched The Resident and uh, decided to vote for Trump? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't exist. But in, in any case, we hear that constantly. We also hear about other countries and their poor populations who are subjected to constant domestic propaganda. And yeah, it's real. They are. Um, but I think they. Uh, it, one of the things I've noticed from traveling to countries that are considered authoritarian is that their populations understand that they're being propagandized. They understand that they're not living in an open society. Uh, Americans tend not to understand that, particularly liberals, particularly highly educated coastal liberals. And, and so what we're looking at with vice in many ways is domestic propaganda. I call it, you know, American regime propaganda. <laughs> uh, and it's extremely insidious. And one of the most insidious aspects is something you've talked about, Robbie, that I want to ask you about real quickly, which is the relationship between vice and the board of broadcast governors, which controls and oversees the content of Voice of America, which is supposed to be projected abroad and according to the Smith Mund Act is not the American population is not supposed to be subjected to you know our soft power media that's projected abroad well yeah that's that's very interesting you mentioned that um, the the repealing of that act because again the timing really does line up with sort of this torrent and this shift into more obvious foreign policy propaganda on behalf of vice and this was something I picked up on while working on a very heavy agenda. Um, You mentioned the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Um, It was, you know, it was looking at their actual auditing reports. The Broadcasting Board of Governors has a website where they uh, have monthly updates about all the sort of uh, 
US and other media outlets around the world that are using their content. And what I noticed immediately, and this is actually after I had noticed that Vice was already using a lot of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, um, B-roll in their video specials. There's just some, I just noticed their logo in the you know bottom left corner. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, you, don't, you don't usually see that, you know, kind of B-roll and other people's stuff. So I looked at the Broadcasting Board of Governors website, which you know, runs Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And in their monthly auditing reports, they are actually quite proud of how often Vice uses their content, um, almost monthly. And, you know, you look at it lined up with all the other media outlets, and you could make the case that Vice uses content from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, more often than almost any other U.S. media outlet does, which is strange in and of itself. But what's e- what was even stranger to me is I immediately noticed when going back to and trying to trace back every auditing report that they released and the and the actual vice content that was mentioned in each one, clicking on the articles, going back to each one individually, I f- saw very quickly that you know they would mention Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty by name, but they would never mention. The fact that Radio Free Liberty, Radio Europe is a U.S. state-funded media outlet. Radio Liberty used to be radio uh, for liberation from Bolshevism after the Cold War, just for some <laughs> context there. <laughs> yeah, so they, you know, they would mention it by name, but not mention what it was. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, um, you know, just on the surface, but it is when you psh, when you look at the larger picture of Vice, when any time there is any other you know, foreign media outlet. Um, And of course, they don't say um, BBC is a UK government-ran outlet or Al Jazeera, Qatari, you know, government outlet or anything like that. They, it's mostly reserved for things like Russia. So, along, you know, around the same time, they're running all this Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty content without saying it was US state-funded media. They're running it alongside stories that would say, you know, kind of implying how dirty Russian media is and, and going out of their way at every moment to, to make, make sure their listeners and their, you know, readers knew that RT was a Kremlin-funded media outlet, that Sputnik was a Kremlin-funded media outlet, that, you know, this is a North Korean government propaganda press release, this is Iran, Iranian state-run TV, press TV, um, they would always mention that when talking about any other foreign media outlet. So, that, you know, that was notable in and of itself to me because they were basically trying to normalize um, U.S. state-funded media in their own publication. And there was actually only one vice reporter um, who, uh, who actually properly labeled it as such, as U.S. state-funded media, out of maybe 40 different examples that I found that mentioned nothing about it being U.S. state-funded media. So, I found that interesting because... Um, you know, why would they be trying to normalize the Broadcasting Board of Governors content around this same time period, frankly, around the time when this, you know, uh, propagandizing within our own country law was basically repealed. Um, So, and, you know, later on, the Broadcasting Board of Governors bought Interpreter Mag, um, and then later, I guess, you know, uh, sold it off again or let them go independent again, apparently. This was Michael Weiss's uh, magazine, and we were earlier talking about the Michael Weiss helmets, the Syria regime trains trolls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael Weiss helmets. For listeners who don't know, I mean, Michael Weiss is, you know, the, the ever-transforming neoconservative operative who supports every U.S. war. And Max wrote a detailed expose looking back at some of Weiss's old blog posts. I mean, this is a guy who ran as a Republican for office in New York and who organized anti-Muslim rallies with hate monger Pam Geller, who's the, a darling of the alt-right. This is at a time when Weiss, when Michael Weiss was working for a McCarthyite super right-wing pro-Israel group that was monitoring media and trying to impose anti-Palestinian bias in media reporting. And today, now suddenly, in the past few years, Weiss has transformed himself suddenly. He's transmogrified into an expert on Syrian rebels, and he's an apologist for hyper-Islamist extremist Salafi jihadist rebels, even though a decade before he was organizing anti-Muslim rallies in New York. And of course, he's also now he claims to be uh, an expert, not just on Syria, but also on Iran and on Russia and really any country the U.S. is targeting this week. 
he's kind of like the fungus that grew off of Christopher Hitchens' grave. <laughs> <laughs> but but for context for listeners Weiss edited this this magazine this project called the interpreter the primary goal of which was to translate Russian media outlets but Michael Weiss did not speak any Russian even though he edited this <laughs> never been to Russia you know one of the we, we've been talking about some of the personnel at Vice um, a lot of people don't know that Vice's managing director is Michael Moynihan uh, Michael Moynihan is part of another interconnected um, socio- social and political network that we've been discussing. Um, you know, he's a very close uh, buddy of Eli Lake and Jamie Kerchick, the kind of neoconservative scene in Washington. Um, you know, I knew him years ago. Very nice person, uh, erudite, uh, competent, also just a card-carrying neoconservative, very pro-Israel, but more, more than that, he's just a supporter of American unsheathed, unbridled power. Um, and he's into the great power games and he's been made managing editor and it's no coincidence. He was sort of the vo- face and voice of Vice's seminal American regime propaganda package, A World in Disarray. Um, you know, this is neoconservative propaganda on steroids. Uh, and it's it's undisguised. I mean, there's there's it's it's not even you know, masked in a hipster aesthetic. Um, Ben, I don't know if you want to kind of intro this documentary, but I thought we should dedicate some serious time to this because uh, this really is Vice's major neoconservative coming out party is what this documentary is. Absolutely. And I think this is really the solidifying moment at which we can really say that Vice has really merged with the foreign policy apparatus. You know, I mean, this isn't necessarily to support Obama. We've been very critical of Obama. But Obama had this interesting term he used. He called the foreign policy blob in Washington. And, you know, it's it's this line of think tanks and lobbying groups and the military industrial complex, which all kind of coalesce to push for more war, for regime change, for intervention. And Vice has not only been towing the line for several years now, as we articulated, but it has really merged with that effectively. And the kind of coming out moment is this documentary, which was released in late 2017, called A World in Disarray. You can find it on YouTube. It's free. And that title is lifted directly from a book that was just published by Richard Haas. Richard Haas is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR. And the Council on Foreign Relations, for listeners, this is really the de facto think tank of the U.S. empire and of really of the U.S. government. I mean, it's technically independent, but it's really the leading voice in Washington, D.C., in the world of think tanks, respectable experts and senior fellows and academia that is really intellectually justifying every single U.S. and NATO foreign policy endeavor. I mean, that, that's really the, the reason it exists. It's been around nearly 100 years. It was founded in 1921, and that is exactly the role it has played for this past century. And the film that Vice released was not only featuring and based on Richard Haas's book. Richard Haas is the main interviewee who comes back throughout the film. Michael Moynihan, who's the neoconservative host of this Vice documentary, uh, he opens it by interviewing Richard Haas, and he closes the film, again, interviewing Richard Haas, leaving him with the final words. But it's not just that the whole film revolves around Haas and his book. The Council on Foreign Relations actually co-produced this entire film with Vice Media. And the Council on Foreign Relations posted, cross-posted the full documentary on its own YouTube channel. And uh, Richard Haas is listed as a producer on this documentary. And as you can imagine, this feature-length documentary, which is a very high quality, it's impressive, it focuses primarily on four conflicts. And surprise, surprise, those four conflicts are all the targets right now of U.S. imperialism. Syria, Ukraine slash Russia, China, and North Korea. And, I mean, we can go through the nitty-gritty of the documentary because it's really important. We should talk about the actual countries it focuses on. But as an overview, this Vice documentary that was co-produced with the Council of Foreign Relations features Condoleezza Rice of the Bush administration, Tony Blair, the British prime minister who, along with George W. Bush, invaded Iraq illegally, Samantha Power, another, you know, right-to-protect R2P war hawk, 
And then what's actually hilarious is it also features a lesser known but equally pernicious figure, Francis Fukuyama. Fukuyama famously wrote a book in which he declared that after the end of the Cold War, history had ended. His book is called The End of History and the Last Man. It was published in 92. And he said that capitalist democracy and the U.S.-led hegemonic order is the end of history and the free market controls all and there is no alternative. Kind of ushering in the triumphalist narrative that really claimed victory for the Cold War and... Uh, led us to where it led the U.S. to where it is with Russia, which is a new Cold War, as the U.S. kind of drove the expansion of NATO up to Russia's borders. I mean, the the the, the destructive narrative that emanated from Fukuyama's book, which he has sort of um, renounced, can't be overstated. Um, and that's why I think it's significant that Fukuyama reappears in this documentary, along with, you know, Tony Blair as a kind of voice of wisdom, uh, Samantha Power, Condi Rice, I mean, Tomas Ilves, who is the former prime minister of Estonia, who is now at the Hoover Institution in uh, Stanford, which is this nest of neocons. I mean, it's just like basically a grotesque gallery of neocons all posing as this pantheon of wise men and women who will guide us into the new American century but they're also lamenting you know that th there's a this this documentary is a lamentation for the decline of american power and there's a sense a really palpable sense of anxiety among these characters uh robbie i mean you watch you watch this as well i mean what, what, what what's your take on a world in disarray i i mean i agree with what ben said it's it is the most blatant sort of codification of vice sort of growing into this blatant mouthpiece for U.S. foreign policy propaganda um, that I've ever seen. Um, they, I mean, they've done things kind of like this before, but nothing, nothing on this level. I mean, as you said, it is actually produced by uh, Richard Haas in part, um, and you know, the Council on Foreign Relations um, was so proud of this documentary um, that they actually have a, a very, very detailed sort of class syllabus. Um, done by Richard Haas on the Council on Foreign Relations webpage about this special. And if you, if you go down to the supplementary materials that Richard Haas feels that you should read to better understand this special, they include supplementary, supplemental materials from Elliot Abrams, Michael <laughs> McFall, Tom Cotton. Tom Cotton, um, who's a climate change denier. And uh, you guys would probably recognize a lot of the other names in here, but a lot of, um, you know, very prominent sort of U.S. foreign policy pro-regime change people in here. Yeah, yeah, Robert Ford, I mean, the, the fake ambassador to Syria, who is just, his job was basically to sell the moderate rebels like a used car salesman is selling like a AMC gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. I'm looking at the list right now. I mean, it's incredible. Fiona Hill, who's now in the Trump administration and is there as the kind of neocon plant to make sure that Trump doesn't do anything to uh, too too nice with Russia. Um, so so yeah, I mean, Ben mentioned that this documentary kind of it's divided into four parts. The four basically parts of the U.S. target board in the world. Yeah, it's actually not a coincidence that in December the Trump administration released a new national security strategy in which it declared that the top so-called threats to U.S. national security are China, Russia and North Korea, and then also Iran. And three of those four are also subjects of this exact documentary by Vice. The only country that's not covered by Vice is Iran, although Iran is, of course, part of the Syria segment. The other three, China, Russia, and North Korea, have their own segments in this Vice documentary. So let's just go through the documentary itself and discuss how Vice perpetuates this propaganda. It starts with Moynihan interviewing Haas and establishing Haas's credibility. Haas, uh, you know, they criticize the Iraq war to further establish their credibility, even though Moynihan was a really fervent supporter of that. Yeah, they use this classic tactic that a lot of war hawks use, where they kind of lightly criticize the Iraq war, not the war itself. In fact, Haas insists that the Iraq war was led for good intentions. He, he expressly says that, but they all just say that it was a mistake and that it wasn't done correctly. So not that it was criminal, but just that the war wasn't fought well. But then at the same time, they defend the war in Afghanistan, which is of course also portrayed as a benevolent war. Here's the clip. The international community largely backed the invasion of Afghanistan, 
after the Taliban refused to give up Osama bin Laden. But the U.S. decision to go into Iraq caused deep divisions amongst Western allies. After 9-11, President Bush and others around them saw this as a real opportunity to change the course of history, that if we could oust Saddam Hussein, they believed, I think wrongly, that we could promote democratic tendencies inside Iraq, and it would set an example the rest of the region couldn't resist. So you, be you believe that? I mean, that that was really one of their biggest motivations? 100%, I am confident that they saw Iraq as setting in motion a, a set of regional dynamics that would leave the Middle East transformed. The film just pounds on the idea that U.S. foreign policy is based purely on benevolence and trying to create good in the world, and that is why the U.S. wages all these wars. And that's really portrayed by the narrator himself. Michael Moynihan is the host of this and the narrator, but what's interesting is he blatantly editorializes in the documentary. People who watch it should keep in mind that Moynihan doesn't even really pretend to be neutral. So he opens the film, the first thing he says is, The world wasn't supposed to be this way. In the decades following World War II, the United States led the way in shaping the world order. Let every nation know that we shall pay any price to assure the survival and the success of liberty. And no matter how the world seemed to change, American moral, military, and economic dominance never seemed to waver. That's the clip, uh, Kodo drum and bass drops and all. <laughs> so that's how he opens the documentary. It's framed from the very get-go as a pro-U.S. documentary. And the whole premise of the movie is that the reason the world is in disarray is because the U.S. empire is in decline. That is the primary reason. Yeah. They even use the term the supremacy of the Western liberal order. <laughs> yes, and they make sure to stress that that supremacy was maintained through the violence of the U.S. empire. Here's the clip. Bush, in his 1991 State of the Union address, laid out his vision of American moral preeminence. The coalition's resounding victory in the Gulf War seemed to reaffirm the supremacy of the Western liberal order, underpinned by American military power. I mean, they're lamenting the decline of our supremacy. <laughs> there it is. It's all right there. They just say it openly. It's pure propaganda. Uh, and the rise of a multipolar world, the horror. The horror. But Robbie, uh, what do you think when, I mean, the, the film moves into its first section. It moves into Syria. And so we've learned kind of that Iraq is bad. Uh, Condi Rice uh, then tells us that, you know, the real failure in Syria is that we didn't do what we did in Iraq, which is a massive regime change operation with no plan the day after. I mean, what, what were your thoughts on the, f the first section? I mean, I was just, I always find it really amusing when, um, you know, these neocons try to basically claim that, you know, the way we handled Iraq was a mistake now. And they act, you know, they, they sort of try to get on that, um, the sort of rewriting history about, you know, how much of a mistake it was to them and, you know, there's various failures and things like that. Um, and it, it, I mean, it is, it's, to me, it's, it was just really depressing and disturbing. Um, even just the fact that Condoleezza Rice is legitimized to this degree and she's just in a Vice documentary um, with no critical analysis whatsoever on her no mentioning of the fact that she blatantly lied in front of the 9-11 commission i mean in my mind she's one of the worst bush officials if i actually think back to the bush administration so just her being in the documentary in and of itself being able to talk about these issues seriously you know with no criticism in and of itself was just you know made my it made me sick to my stomach <laughs> yeah i mean when you when she comes on screen anyone who remembers Iraq would be should you know just immediately have a visceral reaction but also Tony Blair he comes in as a voice of reason and he said you know we shouldn't have <laughs> uh, we should have known going in that this was going to spread uh, Islamist uh, extremism across Iraq and he's he's speaking as if he himself had no role in going to war that he was just an innocent bystander um, for this to I mean how, how can British viewers look at this I mean, Tony Blair can't walk down the street in the UK with someone not trying to put him under citizen's arrest. How can they look at this and not see it as just overt propaganda? 
Well, and it's also hilarious because we know, thanks to the Chilcott report, which of course was not mentioned in the documentary, that Tony Blair was repeatedly warned by British intelligence officers that they knew that Al-Qaeda would be greatly strengthened by the war in Iraq. And of course, he still did it anyway, because the war in Iraq was not about countering terrorism, and the war on terror isn't about countering terrorism. But I think actually what we're getting at is a very important point about the documentary, and that's that I think the word neoconservative, if it's used in a more broad sense, it can certainly apply to the documentary, but this is more than that. Neoconservatives frequently apply to like one particular stratum. The, The point of this documentary, which I think reflects Vice's editorial policy, is it is bipartisan support for imperialism. Yeah. And so you have figures. Yeah, you're, you're You have right. Condoleezza Rice, you have Fukuyama, you have Samantha Power, you know, these kinds of more hardline neoconservatives. But then you also have people like Chris Murphy. Chris Murphy is a new senator who's kind of, you know, cut his teeth as uh, a foreign policy expert. He's actually criticized the war in Yemen, which is great. But what Vice is trying to do is say that even if you support the Bush administration, even if you're Tony Blair, even if you support Obama, we can all agree mutually that the problem is that the U.S. is in decline and that other countries are on the rise and that the world is is returning to a multipolar world. So it's an attempt in the era of Trump to say, look, we may have some political disagreements, but when it comes to imperialism, when it comes to war and regime change, we all agree. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. This, this is... Basically, um, a, a think tank like the CFR now, and sort of the approach, I think, is they really want to emphasize that bipartisan foreign policy consensus. And I think you can also see it mirrored in other think tanks, um, especially like the CNAS, which now wasn't Victorian. New- for listeners, this is the Center for New American Security. It's Michelle Flournoy, um, who was a was the Assistant Secretary of Defense under uh, Ash Carter in the Obama Pentagon. I think Newland might be there as well. I think she just got appointed as the head of it. Yeah, Victoria Newland is the CEO of Center for New American Security. That's right. And Michelle Flournoy is on the board of directors of CNAS. I mean, that that has a lot of, you know, there's bipartisan foreign policy players in that. And this new think tank, which has a much more narrow focus, but I believe it's sort of coming from the same sphere, is the Alliance for Securing Democracy. This is out of the German Marshall Fund. Yeah. Yeah, Max wrote an excellent, detailed two-part expose on the Alliance for Securing Democracy. I'll link to that, of course, in the show notes for this episode. But the Alliance for Securing Democracy, if you look at their board and, and the members who sit on it, it's, they're sort of comprised of that same sort of neoliberal, neocon, bipartisan foreign policy consensus as well. And I think that, you know, th- we're going we're gonna to be seeing a lot more of this in the future. Um, you know, in a very heavy agenda, I was showing sort of the, the lead up to what eventually happened, which was this sort of pivot um, where the neocons and the neoliberals were sort of coming together on issues of foreign policy. Yes, yeah, Syria was the pinnacle on that, where they all agree. Now, I believe we really are seeing it codified into a real a legitimate and sh- very strong movement. And it's an it's, it's right now it's an anti-Trump movement because they've been left out, although they're bringing a lot of their functionaries in the administration. But it started as kind of the never Trump movement. Yeah, it started as that, yeah. And they're forced to take up these kind of positions and board board positions at think tanks because they're cooling their heels and they're waiting for 2020. You know, their narrative is really distilled perfectly into a world in disarray. And I think part of that narrative, what's interesting about it is the attempt they make to kind of square the circle and the attempt they make to explain Obama in the larger pantheon following Bush of U.S. foreign policy is what they say is, The Iraq war was a mistake, we can agree, but the war in Afghanistan was the good war. I mean, that's just taken for granted. Moynihan just states that basically openly. And what they say is, Bush made the mistake of projecting power too much, and Obama supposedly made the mistake of not projecting U.S. power enough. That's the argument that's made in this movie, and that's the argument that is used by these kinds of bipartisan imperialists to justify how they can coalesce you know, this narrative in U.S. foreign policy. And Richard Haas, the president of the Council of Foreign Relations, he, he has a quote in this documentary, which he says 12 minutes into it. If Iraq in 2003 is the textbook case of the dangers of overreach in foreign policy, Syria is, has emerged as the textbook case of, uh, of doing too little. When you don't act, it can be every bit as consequential as the mistakes you make when you overdo things. 
there's this whole narrative, which is, of course, outrageous. And Max and I have done two episodes about this specifically. The narrative is that the U.S. didn't do anything in Syria and that Obama just watched the country as it descended into chaos. And actually, Michael Moynihan from Vice, in A World in Disarray, he claims, In the wake of American retreat, the Middle East would continue to fracture and descend further into chaos. And in no place were the consequences more catastrophic than the war in Syria. But I'm sitting here watching this documentary and thinking to myself, American retreat from the Middle East? What are you talking about? <laughs> when has the when has the U.S. retreated from the Middle East? What? Yeah, yeah. But this is he just takes this as if it's a fact that's for granted. And and what's funny is a few minutes later they lament that the Obama administration supposedly the Obama administration stopped short of providing the level of military support needed to overthrow the Syrian government. Max and I, in episodes two and three of Moderate Rebels, we detail how this is a blatant lie. We look at some of the declassified U.S. government documents from the Defense Intelligence Agency. We're talking about massive arms shipments. And also, we're talking about billions of dollars spent not just by the CIA, and this, this was the largest covert program in CIA history since the war in the 1980s in Afghanistan, which created al-Qaeda and the Taliban, but also billions of dollars funding rebels from Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar. None of this is really acknowledged. Instead, they just impose this narrative and they say, Obama didn't support the rebels enough. And when they show the rebels, what does Vice cut to? Vice cuts to footage of the Islamic Front. <laughs> this is an explicitly extremist Salafi coalition of rebel groups that oppose democracy and secularism and that put Shia civilians, including women and children, in cages, yeah. parading them around. It's not just footage, it's embedded footage. It's footage that clearly comes from the media activists of this group, Jaysh al-Islam, which is a Saudi proxy group that's still festering in East Ghouta, east of Damascus. So just the whole narrative, I mean, the way they try to square that circle is they say, Bush made the mistake of being a little too aggressive. Obama made the mistake of supposedly not being aggressive enough. The real answer lies in between those, and we can all just be happy bipartisan warmongers. It's <laughs> it's a uh, it's a uh, very very upsetting. I mean, it just it is really interesting how there was this much blatant CIA involvement in Syria for so long. But because Obama backed down from the red line threat, um, that they've been able to shape this narrative that Obama essentially, you know, dropped the ball on Syria and and didn't try for regime change. I mean, it's it's incredibly bizarre, and I and I actually wonder what Obama himself thinks about this narrative being put out now. Like, is he? I mean, is he just on a personal level okay with the fact that they're sort of throwing him under the bus too and showing, you know, trying to present him as being this weak figure when he did all this incredible damage to Syria? It's a strange narrative that you're trying to put out. Well, Obama's too busy kite surfing with the billionaire Richard Branson right now. <laughs> it's a great question. That is, I think that's one of the best questions to ask about the post-Obama era, or the Obama post-presidency. You know, he's been drifting off on this endless luxury vacation and having like um, splash fights with Richard <laughs> Branson. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've noticed about Obama, while well, John Brennan is clearly leaking stories to trash him and portray him as weak, and Joe Biden at CFR uh, two or three days ago on stage with Richard Haas threw Obama under the bus. Uh, on why they didn't act more strongly against Putin about, you know, uh, the uh, DNC hack and so forth. They're all trashing him left and right because he wasn't enough of an imperialist for them. Yeah. Um, he has said nothing about Russiagate. I mean, I haven't seen him say anything about it. And you wonder why. And I've also, you know, he has obviously done nothing to defend himself, but that's classic Obama. I mean, he was having his um, citizenship as an American questioned by Fox News day after day, and he didn't say anything about that. So it's a, it, it is a great question. The serious section of a world in disarray is just, uh, you know, one national security state official from both parties trashing Obama. Um, but they really give away the game at the end of this section. Uh, when Russia is introduced, someone who laments that Russia has now been the force that's come in to stabilize Syria. They don't explain why Russia intervened, which was that the U.S. was dumping so many heavy weapons into these um, Salafi and Salafi jihadi rebels uh, that they had taken Idlib and were advancing on the coast and that Russia had basically had to intervene to prevent the country from turning to Libya or Afghanistan, from you know Lebanon being flooded with ISIS. Um, they're, they're, but they're, they're, what they're really upset about 
is that Syria was not broken apart because Syria was the only um, sort of client of Russia within the Arab League, and Russia is able to come in and clean up the mess that the U.S. made. Along with the Syrian army in Iran, they wipe out ISIS. And so this, again, isn't really about saving the Middle East or promoting democracy. It's about empire. It's about the strategy that was laid out in the Clean Break document, Project for a New American Century, which is destabilization and fragmentation, and you know, ultimately focusing in on the great prize, which is the bigger countries, Iran, Russia. And then it moves to China and, and North Korea. I mean, which, which is, it totally foreshadows the narrative that we're hearing now out of the Trump administration, but also out of the national security apparatus in Washington. Well, there, there's been a pathological um, current advice uh, in terms of whitewashing the Syrian rebel program and also calling out, as you said, people for, quote, caping for Assad. So, for example, there was a there's a former vice reporter. His name is Danny Gold, who has basically been calling out people for caping for Assad for years on Twitter, like a lot of these ex vice reporters still do. So, when I asked him about what he meant by that and why, you know, who was caping for Assad, he sort of got into it with me. I don't know if he called out, you know, you guys specifically. Yeah, Gold has viciously attacked me and Max, but he essentially was downplaying. Uh, the CIA uh, role in Syria, and he said, I don't think the CIA is as influential or as effective as you think they are. <laughs> you know, this is right after uh, the U.S. government, it, it was admitted that it was one of the most expensive efforts um, to train rebels since the 1980s, um, and in terms of this over $1 billion CIA program, um, you know, it probably cost a lot more than that. We probably won't ever really get the real figure. But there is, there is a, a, a pattern there of people doing this. Um, and you brought up the, you know, the fact that this is kind of a continuation of project for the new American century. Well, oddly, you know, as much as these neocons and the CFR and Bill Crystal and all these people act like they hate Trump, he, Trump's own national security strategy that came out on December 19th is in some ways virtually identical. If you remove a little bit of the Russia stuff, it is virtually identical to basically this CFR thesis. Yes. And it, and it again targets and specifically focuses on North Korea and Iran. And in some instances, Trump's own national security strategy is even more Bush era like. It has more of that cowboy diplomacy flavor to it. So yep. if the neocons can get on board. It's what Bush would have laid out if 9-11 had never happened. Yeah, p possibly. So if, I mean, if they can get on board with that more co cowboy diplomacy vibe again, which they were able to find back then, then, then they're all set you know, for, for these potential new conflicts. So there's going to be a pivot eventually. And, you know, I wouldn't even be surprised if Trump decides to do something on Iran and North Korea, if Bill Crystal writes an apology op-ed. I mean, it sounds, it sounds nuts now, but I mean, I, I see that in the future. I mean, it, it, I see it coming already. It's definitely coming. Ab absolutely. <laughs> I, I can totally see that coming. Um, you know, Bill Crystal is on a PR, a vast PR tour on Twitter um, where he's trying to cater to the sensibilities of liberals by condemning Trump's racism. He's basically become a love Trump's hate neocon. And it's working in a lot of ways. And he gets airtime from Jake Tapper. This is someone who should have been run out of Washington along with David Frum. And they're, they've completely rehabilitated their images. So you're absolutely right. And then beyond that, as you pointed out at the beginning of the show, the big story of Trump's first year is how the sort of national security consensus captured his administration's foreign policy and, you know, with a neoconservative cowboy diplomacy edge and has moved us into this great power conflict with Russia and China. Um, that's why another reason why I thought it was so important to talk about this documentary, A World in Disarray, because it really reflects um, their vision and their blueprint, but laid out in a sophisticated aesthetic. Lots of bass drops and koto drum, dramatic music. I mean, the hipster aesthetic's gone, but there's another aspect I wanted to kind of... I, I noticed, which is the access that vice correspondents... I mean, they send one of their correspondents to each danger zone. You know, they have correspondent fly over the South China Sea to photograph all of the Chinese ships that are in the South China Sea. I mean, it, it, I know it's horrible that Chinese ships are in Chinese territory <laughs> but you know on north korea 
um, Sarush Alvi, who is one of the co-founders of Vice with Gavin McGinnis and Shane Smith, gets a flight with an F-15 pilot over the South and North Korean border, over the 38th parallel. Um, I mean, they get access to A-10 fighter pilots. And, you know, these are, they appear like kind of like the Top Gun crew and they're like cool guys in their flight suits. I mean, when you look at the other militaries from our enemies, they're all this regimented phalanx of brainwashed uh, Praetorian guards. But the Americans are, uh, you know, they have personality and you're getting close to them. So clearly the Pentagon has participated extensively in the production of this documentary. And it's absurd. Sarush Alvi is in the back seat of an F-15 flying, basically doing sonic booms right over North Korean territory. <laughs> I mean, they're threatening a sovereign country and terrorizing people there. I mean, imagine if people on the U.S.-Mexico border had Chinese overflights, how they would react. And Vice is participating in it as if these F-15s are protecting a population and not actually, you know, in some ways occupying South Korea. I found that to be one of the most offensive dimensions of the documentary, but also one of the most revealing because it ex exposes the access that Vice has to the D Department of Defense or vice versa. And, and not just the access, it's, I mean, the access is one thing, but it's also, why would they keep set parts like that in the documentary unless they were wanted to intentionally normalize this idea of like palling around with the U.S. military in that way? And that's also what I find strange about it, um, that they seem time and time again to want to show footage like that in their documentaries. Um, and you know, people who have access or who embedded, are embedded with U.S. troops for a long period of time, um, you, you will eventually, if you keep the cameras rolling, get some very embarrassing footage almost in every instance. I mean, if you're, if you're a serious journalist who, you know, has cr criticisms of U.S. foreign policy, I mean, a lot of even BBC reporters who are embedded in Afghanistan during the Bush administration got U.S. soldiers to say the craziest things I've ever heard. Um, there was a BBC reporter who just was there for days and days who just uh, started asking them what they think, you know, 9-11 was about and why they think they're here in response to 9-11. And almost none of the soldiers actually knew that we weren't attacked by Afghanistan on 9-11. So it's like, if Vice has this much access, you would just imagine that at a certain point, they would get a U.S. soldier to say something completely ridiculous or a U.S. official to just say something totally embarrassing or even bloodthirsty. But yet, you never see any of that footage make it into the documentaries. So what is it? Is it just all on the cutting room floor? Um, so... So that's, I mean, interesting to me also, because it's like none of, that's all, it just shows how sanitized these documentaries are. I mean, it's shocking. You watch this and you're looking for one critical voice, uh, one, one person to interject some anti-war statement, and you only find it in the Korea section when Vice visits a rally against the anti-THAAD, the terminal high-altitude anti-missile device that um, Lockheed Martin has forced South Korea to buy. Um, you know, After these protests, basically, the U.S. agreed to pay for part of it, but it's a weapon that South Koreans didn't want. And they interview one uh, random guy on a bus going to the protest explaining why he doesn't you know, want this weapon system on the peninsula, but that's it. That's the only critical voice in this entire documentary. And it's a guy on a bus. I mean, <laughs> that, and that really says it all. I mean, that's, that's really, that, that says it all about this whole era for me. Um, you don't even see much, you know, anti-war, many anti-war voices in progressive media these days. I mean, democracy now has kind of closed itself off in a lot of ways. And everyone's focused on, Trump as this singular anomalous phenomenon. So it, it isn't just Vice, but I think, you know, this Vice documentary really offers the most severe example of unsheathed imperialism disguised as a kind of objective on the ground documentary with a millennial friendly aesthetic. What's interesting about Vice's brand today is they still, of course, have semblances of the Vice aesthetic from the 90s with this kind of, you know, nihilistic, drug-obsessed, uh, hip, millennial vibe. And I think you can also see this in its reporting on another issue where, again, it's just blatant propaganda, and that's Venezuela. Vice has done several documentary series on Venezuela, on the protests a few years ago, and then the protests in mid to late 2017. And what's interesting is actually there was a Twitter interaction that really just to me exemplifies Vice's whole editorial line and their aesthetic. 
And it was actually with Robbie's sister, Abby Martin, who is a friend of the show, a great journalist. And uh, Abby Martin called out the aptly named vice producer, Alex Shitty, for <laughs> <laughs> for uh, this documentary he made that is just blatant propaganda that does not once acknowledge the violence of the right wing opposition in Venezuela. And this is at a time when, you know, the, the language used in the U.S. media is hilarious. These armed protesters, which is the language they used, Venezuelan armed protesters, or, you know, as we, we like to call them moderate rebels, were burning black Venezuelans alive. They were bombing bombing security forces, and you, you get on the list. I mean, they were shooting Telesaur journalists. They were attacking government buildings with helicopters and bombing government buildings. Of course, the Vice documentary plays that all down and instead emphasizes and exaggerates the violence of the government and treats it as unique and unidirectional. And Abby Martin on Twitter called out the producer, Alex Chitty, and he replied by just posting emojis laughing. And he was just like, ha, ha, ha. And then he said, you're a propagandist for the Maduro regime, Abby. And it's just childish refusal to engage with these actual substantive criticisms when you're called out in this kind of like hip, detached, millennial way. So then I looked up more about this Alex Chitty fellow. And there's another article that was posted in 2015 after they created the first Venezuela documentary. And Vice interviews Alex Chitty. It interviews its own producer. And he talks about when he went to Venezuela, and this is his response. He says, and I'm quoting here, Oh, we went to Venezuela. We, we, we got driven out to one of the nastiest bits of Caracas. We walked into this drug storage house where the guy was like, You have balls of steel, but I like you guys. He showed off his load. This is an exact quote. He showed off his load of coke and said, We have 10 more houses like this. That house had 120 kilos, which is worth about $10 million. So in this interview, the producer of this Venezuela documentary is just kind of laughing and joking about how they, they hang out with these drug dealers who sell coke in Venezuela and who have $10 million worth of coke. And then at the same time, they produce documentaries about how the elected Maduro regime is so evil and it's just killing people left and right. They have ties to drug dealers. <laughs> <laughs> that we hang out with. I mean, it's just the, the levels of hypocrisy are so obscene. And what the aesthetic, what that hipster aesthetic lets vice do, and this is a very millennial phenomenon, it's widespread, is they use irony as a crutch. They use irony as a tool. So they don't actually engage with any serious criticism because they're just like, oh, it's ironic. Oh, we're just being cool and hip and edgy. And because it's edgy, they don't have to actually engage with the real world politically. And they can just spew out this propaganda. It's the best of both worlds. You get entertaining, edgy propaganda, and you get agitprop that supports the line of the U.S. State Department every single time. Well, yeah, they're, I mean, their Venezuela coverage is absolutely abysmal. And they've been, you know, when, when there have been protests in venezuela before you can you can go back and watch some of their earlier video specials that are just as problematic um and i guess the only the only thing i'll i'll leave the audience with here that that i think is important is um one of the biggest i believe blatant uh, propaganda well actually it was a series that vice produced um was called russian roulette and it was hosted by um vice reporter simon ostrowski and the probably one of the most noteworthy aspects of it is he was actually embedded with the neo-Nazi Azov battalion um, militia um, that's officially sponsored by the Ukrainian army. And in this special, um, going back to the sort of the edge culture aesthetic you were talking about earlier, um, there's actually a section in it where Simon kind of, you know, goes on this little monologue for a second about how Azov is controversial and how they listen to a lot of black metal with German lyrics, militant, you know, with militant imagery. He never mentions the word Nazi. He never calls them neo-Nazi. Only in one of the descriptions for three of these embedded Azov battalion specials do they mention uh, under the Vice um, description that Azov is a le has alleged links to neo-Nazism. But yet, on one of the specials, Simon is standing right in front of one of their caravans, the Azov Battalion caravans, where you can literally see a giant neo-Nazi uh, logo on the side of their caravan um, <laughs> that he's doing a stand-up in front of, without mentioning anything about the imagery, um, without mentioning the double lightning bolts, you know, on all over their 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 uniforms or anything like that. Oh my um, god! So that in and of itself is just one example of how. Um, you know, before the world knew 
that there were actual neo-Nazi militias in Ukraine. Vice was essentially trying to whitewash it as best as they could. Um, but now we've learned that that, you know, that, you know, back then they were saying, oh, that's just Russian propaganda that there are neo-Nazis there. We know now that that's obviously was the case, that there, that there were and still are neo-Nazi militias. Uh, one of them is about to actually get money um, and probably already has gotten some U.S. money um, because of this new, uh, I believe it was over $500 million weapons shipment to Ukraine. It was just authorized by Trump. So um, neo-Nazi militias are going to have uh, U.S. weaponry soon, and uh, in, in part thanks to Vice uh, for whitewashing uh, what they were. Um, in Ukraine. So thank you, Vice. Yeah, thank you, Vice. Thanks, Vice. Um, <laughs> and as I reported last week at The Real News, the Azov Battalion has already received U.S. weapons. The PSRL-1 grenade launcher has been in the hands of Azov, and Azov has been receiving American uh, military trainers uh, for logistical discussions. So, uh, you know, Vice has indeed played a part in normalizing this relationship, normalizing the relationship with uh, Syrian insurgent mercenaries. Um, we're going to post a lot of the material or all of the material that we mentioned, the reading material on our uh, Moderate Rebels website, and it'll kind of be the counterpoint to uh, Richard Haas's uh, Vice Special Report World in Disarray teaching notes that's at the CFR website. <laughs> um, in addition, we're going to post, and this is, I think, the most important link, uh, Robbie Martin's A Very Heavy Agenda documentary, which, I, as I said before, is really the best document of the normalization of neoconservatism in American life. Um, and Robbie, why don't you tell us um, you know, where listeners can find it off our website? Well, you can... You can either get it on DVD or um, stream it online um, for rent, or you can purchase it for download uh, at www.averyheavyagenda.com. Um, the stream is off of vimeo.com, um, and you can find it on there also if you just want the digital stream. And uh, check out uh, the podcast I do with Abby and my sister, Um uh, it's on SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes. Um, it's called Media Roots Radio, and we've talked about Vice uh, quite a lot on our on our podcast. Excellent show, excellent show. Ben, uh, you want to wrap it up here? Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Robbie. It was a really good discussion. I think we packed a lot in here, and hopefully, we'll make some regime change flax from Vice uh, very angry by this episode. We'll know we accomplished our goal, but uh, let, let's keep in touch, and hopefully, we'll have you on in the future to discuss whenever uh trump is going to invade whatever country he'll invade next robbie thanks thanks guys thanks for listening to moderate rebels as always we will have show notes for our episode and our website is moderaterebelsradio.com if you would like to support what we're doing here at moderate rebels and if you'd like to gain access to exclusive content please consider subscribing at our patreon page that is patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And of course, we're on social media. We're on Twitter at moderate radio, and we're on Facebook at moderate rebels radio. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>